Uh, I'm here to speak with you today about Pathway to Change, the Jail Labyrinth Project and Documentary. This was a collaboration that involved many different disciplines within our local community. Hampshire County Jail is situated just outside the city of Northampton. It is home to approximately 250 inmates. While I was employed at the jail, I had the opportunity to attend a workshop involving the labyrinth. I was so impressed, I asked the facilitator if she would come to the jail and do a pilot program for the incarcerated men that I worked with there. Our program was so successful that we then went on to develop a 12-week curriculum. This was a skill-based program with topics that included forgiveness, moral development, mindfulness, problem solving, and decision making, just to name a few. After the lecture held in the classroom at our correctional facility, the men were then led in a guided meditation. They then walked a portable labyrinth that we had laid out on the floor. At the conclusion of class, we discussed options for behavioral changes and ways to implement them into their daily living. At one of the workshops, the idea of constructing an outdoor labyrinth came up. When we approached Sheriff Garvey at the jail, he responded, yes, if you can get the funding, go ahead with the project. Now, you may wonder what a labyrinth is and why we would do a program like this at a correctional facility. facility. This is a labyrinth uh, on the coast of Maine and they are an ancient and sacred symbol over 4,000 years old. They are not affiliated with any particular religion. The labyrinth has one entrance. It follows a circuitous path leading into a center and then back out again. I like to refer to it as a moving meditation. The benefits of walking a labyrinth are many. It clears the mind, revitalizes energy, calms the body, and reduces stress. Correctional facilities can be very chaotic places in which to live. Short periods of serenity, as those experienced on the labyrinth, are highly prized. As an aside, in a small research study that we did, we found another benefit of walking the labyrinth. Not surprisingly, it lowers blood pressure and pulse. The volunteer crews of incarcerated men did countless hours of manual labor. This is early in the project when they're just opening up the field where the labyrinth is going to be. A few more examples of the men working. Correctional staff also participated in the project operating heavy equipment when it was needed. These are supplies being delivered. The pathways for our labyrinth, which was 80 feet, it's a very, very large labyrinth and the first of its kind in the United States within a correctional facility, probably in the world. These are bluestone being delivered that were part of the pathways and they were set in gravel. This is an added bonus because we had to do underground piping to divert water from the actual labyrinth we had this water feature that sits beside the labyrinth. This is one of the members of our local community who came in to work with the men and taught them how to maintain the labyrinth. Um, all the plantings that are on the labyrinth that you'll see in further slides were donated by the local community. This is Sheriff Robert Garvey. He is a very pro-education and treatment sheriff. In 2005, he was the number one sheriff in the United States. He's a remarkable man. This is him addressing the um, guests that came to the labyrinth dedication ceremony held at the jail. This is Don Wright. He's one of the incarcerated men, and you can see many of the other men that worked on the project. He is addressing the crowd that came for the dedication. And this is the crowd in the uh, um, auditorium at the jail, giving the men a standing ovation for their work on this project. One of the men that participated in the project as a laborer, and you can just see the pride in his face at the accomplishment of completing the labyrinth. 
This particular picture shows um, the stark contrast between the razor wire surrounding the correctional facility and the beauty of the labyrinth. As one man put it, when, he walk, when I walk the labyrinth, I'm no longer locked up, I'm free. Now I'd like to share some very, very compelling statistics on the state of corrections in our country today. The United States leads the world in the number of people we incarcerate, right about 698 people per 100,000. The country second behind us is Rwanda with 492 people per 100,000. This stat shows the lifetime likelihood of United States citizens born in the year 2001 to be incarcerated. So they looked at two different um, groups, men and women, and they looked at white, uh, Latino, and black. And these numbers are um, they're horrifying. So for white men, we would expect to see about 1 in 17 incarcerated. For Latino men, 1 in 6. And for black, it's 1 in 3. For uh, white women, 1 in 111. For Latino, 1 in 45. And for black women, that number is 1 in 18. The Bureau of Justice estimates our total population of incarcerated people at about 2.2 million. Additionally, and this does not, additional numbers include 4.7 million people that are on probation and parole. Many of these are for nonviolent offenses, and they are due to changes in sentencing law and policy. Now to talk um, a little bit about the cost of incarceration. Each individual in the United States is paying about $260 per year to keep people incarcerated in our country. The total number on that is about $80 billion per year to keep people incarcerated. This is a very poor return for our investment, as far as I can see. And there are collateral costs. We look at the increasing number of women that are incarcerated in our country, and we have to look at the placement of their children and the services their children need in order to be maintained. We look at child welfare, social services, education, and in many cases, these children are placed in foster care because there aren't family members to care for them. These costs are not reflected in the numbers that I've given you on the cost of incarceration. And these are just dollars and cents costs. Can you imagine what it would be like to be a child brought up with one or both parents incarcerated? The great majority of people that are locked up in our country today, if you trace their crimes back, they are related to drugs and or alcohol and many times mental illness, sometimes both. Some people are dually diagnosed in our correctional facilities. These, these, il these have long been um, illnesses, alcoholism, mental illness, and drug addiction. They are illnesses and they are treatable. So we need to see treatment for these people within the correctional system. Many of the people that we incarcerate have huge educational deficits. They haven't had the opportunities that all of us here today have. Just the um, single fact of, of receiving a high school equiv equivalency while incarcerated greatly in increases a person's chance for success after release. And lastly, these people, many of them do not have a marketable skill. So to put vocational training programs into the correction system would offer them a chance to earn a decent wage once they are released. Within corrections, we have a chance to offer a different model and a different, a different model, one of treatment and education, not punishment. Progressive correctional facilities have large staffs of volunteers to support their programming. Our project at Hampshire County Jail was funded by two sources, grant monies and a generous anonymous donation. All of the labor and work done on this project and the time and energy put into it was by the crew of men who were incarcerated that volunteered to go out and build the labyrinth, by community volunteers who came in and worked with jail staff, and by the jail staff themselves. I think we have to look for ways to find creative solutions to help solve this problem in our country. If we can 
find a way to do this in our community. People all over the United States can do the same thing. Um, the now sheriff at Hampshire County Jail, Patrick K. Elaine, has said that we should remember 98% of incarcerated people will be returning to our communities. If we can do something while they're in our care and custody to better their lives, it betters all of society. I want to just end by paraphrasing um, an Irish poet and philosopher, John O'Donohue. He said that you can judge a country by the way they treat their incarcerated people and their mentally ill people. I think we can do better, don't you? Thank you.